Hello, hi. Hello, everybody. Um, we are the Association for the Design of History, short ADH. Um, we are a le international left accelerationist socialist platform who engage in work around um, theory, media, as well as concrete workplace organizing. And um, you will find our links to our social media platforms during during the event in every chat we live stream on as well as in the zoom chat um you can ask questions during the during the event but i will post these questions after micha is finished with his talk and yes yeah, so i will collect the questions feel free and so i would say now micha please take it away unmute unmute yourself <laughs> and yeah all right just let me start the screen share Okay, I hope the screen share works and you can see my screen. So hello everyone, I'm very glad to have you here. And uh, I'm happy to tell you about the Japanese textile workers struggle and the very first strikes in Japan this evening. As the title and the image already suggest, uh, fac uh, factory girls, the textile workers were uh, mostly female in the early period of industrialization in Japan and uh, this group was uh, considered incapable of organizing and um, and taking uh, taking action for several reasons we'll go into during the presentation. Yet also, they actually started the first uh, wave of strikes in Japan. So this is quite a fascinating piece of labor history to take a look at. Uh, first, I'll give a brief introduction to give you some historical context uh, on Japan and uh, the, the problems of researching this problem and general intro to industrialization. Then we'll look at the actual uh, working and living conditions of the textile workers and finally their resistance against them and the forming of class consciousness as workers. Okay, so first, a very brief introduction to the history of Japan. This is just to get you um, to get you a rough overview to know uh, where Japan was standing politically at the time uh, that will be discussed in the talk. This is by no means a complete overview or anything. So until uh, one, 1185, Japan was ruled by its emperor, who was uh, both a religious uh, figure of authority, uh, legitimized by his by a mythological connection to the sun goddess in the Shinto religion, but also the central figure of political power. Uh, then, in, in 1185, in the course of civil war, um, the shogun, uh, so, sort of a highest rank of general, a military ruler, uh, gained power and had at after this point uh, shoguns wielded the actual political power in Japan wh while the emperor was uh, merely a re reduced to his religious function and served as uh, legitimizing the shogun. Um, and Japan was involved in several uh, civil and foreign wars, like for example uh, the Mongol invasions in the late 1200s or the wars with Korea in, in the late 1500s, until one, in 1600, uh, the warlord Tokugawa Ieyasu won a civil war uh, after a power vacuum uh, happened and uh, became shogun. And his clan uh, managed to unite uh, Japan as a country instead of um, several subdomains of warring uh, warlords and uh, managed to maintain maintain this power until 1868. Uh, so there were with more than 200 years of peaceful time. In this time, international contact was also limited. Uh, Japan only had a, an outpost in which it traded with, uh, with Dutch tradesmen and uh, Korea and a few other islands, but otherwise remained uh, secluded from any other countries, which of course affected how technology and modes of production and culture developed uh, due to this uh, closed off state. Also in this long peaceful time, the merchant class uh, could rise to power. And while of course, before that there were merchants, uh, 
in this peaceful time, now they became the, the class with uh, the most social power instead of the warriors in earlier times, who now were more hindered by their obligations to their lords than the merchants who uh, had low social status but no obligations and uh, freedom to travel the country and generate wealth. In 1853, uh, an American gunboat expedition led by Commodore Perry forced Japan under threat of violence to open to trade with the US. Uh, and uh, this, of course, caused uh, unrest and fear of colonization, especially considering the situation with uh, China uh, happening at the same time. And also several other factors uh, that uh, led to the satisfaction with the Tokugawa government led to the so-called major revolution in 1868, which is uh, the beginning of the era in which uh, our talk will take place. So uh, several dissatisfied noblemen deposed the Tokugawa sh shogunate and placed the emperor back into political power. The emperor is now a personal autocratic ruler. And while uh, soon after the major revolution, a constitution slightly similar to and based on, in fact, Western constitutional monarchies is put in place. The, uh, the emperor still has uh, very many per, um, personal powers and also still remains in function as a religious figure. The mythology making the emperor a religious figure is, uh, is of course, revived to legitimize this shift in power. Uh, the, this leads to a, a great resurgence of traditionalism and nativism. So in inventing uh, traditions of the past to legitimize uh, the current political power. Yet on one hand, this uh, big shift to traditionalism was combined with extremely rapid industrialization and modernization, um, which uh, which also was framed national in a nationalistic manner as making Japan great. Okay, so this uh, just for a historical overview. So we know where we stand approximately. And uh, now we'll just take a look at how the role of women in labor looked before industrialization. Okay, so apart from noble families, uh, women also were expected to engage in productive labor apart from reproductive labor. So they had the double burden of maintaining their household and supporting the business either of their their parents' family, or when they were married, of their husband's family or his parents' family. Because uh, in that time, the view of women was deeply influ influenced by Confucianism and could like very roughly be broken down to the woman being basically property and owing total obedience to her parents before marriage and to her husband and her husband's parents after marriage. Um, most occupations were uh, field work, as can be seen here in this uh, woodblock print by Hokusai uh, from 7, 795. Uh, 1795, sorry. You can recognize the women here by their hairstyles on the right, um, but also manufacturing, like preparing woodblock prints for printing, in fact, um, and even very hard labor, like diving for seafood or uh, helping their husbands in the mines. Yet the agrarian sector was dominant and like an agrarian mode of production under feudal relations was uh, how Japan functioned before industrialization. Now, things of course changed when Japan began to industrialize. The textile sector was the biggest sector of industry in Japan until the 1930s, uh, when Japan began to militarize. And then, of course, uh, that type of industry came to the forefront. And it was uh, absolutely formative for Japan's transition to industrialization, to, to the capitalist mode of production. The first Western-style st textile mill uh, already was uh, built in 1867, so even before the major renovation and it, uh, and it just uh, kept rising and accelerating from there. Um, while textile was a very labor intensive industry, Japan, Japan also had quite an abundance of labor forces from because of uh, having lots of very poor people in rural regions since 
uh, before industrialization, Japan was not very urban and people lived in villages outside of uh, the, the few bigger centers. And so there was absolutely no scarcity of labor force whatsoever. In fact, this uh, the situation of uh, poor villagers as a, a labor force uh, played a bigger role in a later debate between Japanese Marxists that uh, went on for a while, but this will become a bit more relevant later. Um, the, the main three branches of the textile industry were silk reeling, cotton sp spinning, and, uh, and weaving. And uh, the, most, the most workers on the production lines were women. You can hear in this, this image from the famous Tomioka silk factory, which, uh, by the way, is still partially preserved today and can be uh, seen as a museum. You see women lined up on the production line here and uh, two men in Western clothes uh, who must be the supervisors or factory owners. The workers were mostly young women and girls from rural areas who were aged between uh, 10 and 25, who were hired as unskilled laborers uh, just for a few years until marriage and then were supposed to return home. We'll look into, a, into how this recruiting process happened a bit uh, later, um, but uh, yeah, textile work was seen as a phase in in a woman's life cycle, and uh, first was framed as in this nationalist manner of uh, serving the state, producing uh, producing goods for the state by the state. In fact, the very first factory workers were not poor women from the countryside, but daughters of the warrior class who were, um, who were easily receptive to this patriotic framing, learned silk, silk reeling and then uh, stopped being workers and some actually uh, um, purchased parts of uh, owning factories and uh, so became bosses themselves. But, Apart from that, the worker population were uh, poor women from rural areas, mostly. In the 1880s, it was around 70% of all textile workers who were women, and in 1909, it was 85.2% of all textile industry workers. Mm. To, co to compare, uh, also most uh, other employed women were still in agriculture, less than 1% at the time were in mining as uh, as helpers and 2% uh, working in typical male industries like machinery and metal. Also, of course, uh, they worked in domestic, in domestic services like housemaids, nursemaids, but this is not uh, usually not really reflected in statistics. But yeah, so we see the vast majority of the textile workers are in fact uh, um, female. So while researching this phenomenon, there unfortunately are some difficulties that we are faced with. Uh, first of all, partially just due to sexism and also due to, the, um, to their employment not being permanent, uh, like a profession that you learn and then continue for life, but just a temporary few years before marriage. Um, those female textile workers were not taken seriously neither by their fellow workers uh, nor by mm, union organizers in the beginning and uh, well bourgeois feminists of the time ha had other concerns like the right to vote or education and did not really engage themselves uh, with the worker population. Generally, the profession of the female te textile, wor textile worker was scorned and looked down upon in society. Uh, so there also, of course, this means that uh, no one took the time to, for example, interview those women about their experiences until uh, quite uh, they, they became accepted by unions at a later time. Uh, there are no first-hand reports or anything, uh, and uh, this just does not come up in labor history research until the 1950s, which leaves us with a gap and quite few sources. There 
as I said, there are no self-reports from the workers, apart from like very few memoirs from those who were well off enough to actually be able to write those memoirs and to obtain an education. What sources we, we do have uh, are, of course, uh, very many statistics and collected both by the government and the industry and uh, yeah, government orders and reports and so on that tell us uh, things about uh, the working conditions, the amount of workers and so on. We have the memoirs from those who were well off to write them. We have statements from police investigations into uh, workers who escaped the factory. Uh, and those were not so few. We will see why uh, in a few slides. And uh, a major thing that is, uh, that is left to us are workers' songs. Um, so, so songs sung while working, of course, have a tradition everywhere, especially in rural circles, uh, circles those women came from. And of course, they made new working songs to suit their situation as factory workers, which often are quite, uh, quite touching reflections of their of the conditions they faced and uh, the reality they op they open us a window in how they uh, saw themselves and their relation to their environment, to their bosses, uh, to their supervisors, to their families. And those are quite well preserved, uh, partially because, uh, well, a song, a song is just a tradition that keeps well. And, uh, and also because later on there was a union magazine that published accounts of, uh, the, of those workers and their stories. But that was like in the 1920s and uh, much, uh, much later than the first strikes and what we are going to talk about. And another problem in research was that until quite recently, the economic aspects of this uh, phenomenon and the social aspects were considered completely separately, which of course is insufficient if one wants to examine, for example, the high turnover rate in this uh, sector from a purely economic perspective, yet does not consider the social factors uh, in influencing this at all. And while, of course, there is now newer research that reflects this, this was uh, not always this way. OK, so now that we have a general idea in this introduction, let us look at the actual conditions that the workers faced. Um, so here you see a production line in silk spinning in the, from 1900. The workers had a 12 to 13 hour workday with uh, two 15 minute breaks usually. And on top of that, they had to work night shifts. And while the night shifts were, it was, were considered disagreeable to the workers, and it was known that uh, it was not uh, neither healthy nor really bus boosting productivity. This was a quite common practice uh, that was that was done and uh, fought over in labor struggles. So uh, the night shifts could mean that a, that a worker could be in the production line for uh, around twenty four hours if she was unlucky. The production halls were not heated during the winter and also, of course, a byproduct from textile production in working with fibers is fine dust. You see here in the picture, the women are not wearing any um, respiratory protection gear because this was just probably not known at this time. And this working with, uh, with fibers and the high humidity of the climate led to disease being rampant, uh, mostly airway diseases like tuberculosis. Uh, but there was no adequate health care at all. And usually uh, sick women were just uh, sent home or otherwise kicked out to prevent contagion of their colleagues. Um, the four women, so like the super supervisors, uh, had a financial interest in reporting mistakes or misbehavior to the factory owner. Um, and that, of course, meant that they uh, they abused their position of superiority, uh, which is uh, thematized quite often in workers' songs, where uh, the four women are seen as uh, both 
as traitors, uh, both uh, with regards to uh, to the to the their class position and with regards to uh, to their sex, uh, as in betraying their fellow women. And uh, sexual violence from supervisors and factory workers was also unfortunately rampant. It was a known issue, which can be found in um, government and industry records, but this was just not done much about due to the um, class differences between the workers and the overseers and supervisors, because uh, the supervisors usually were not coming from the farmer class. Like we're talking, when I say class right now, I don't mean class in a Marxist sense. I mean the social classes of the uh, feudal era in J in Japan at that time. So there were there there, there were noble people, warriors, farmers, and merchants. And uh, farmers and merchants were considered were quite low and had vastly different status than uh, the other two classes. So this uh, sexual violence issue was uh, was a problem that was just not just not really cared about. Okay, so one might wonder, maybe there was adequate compensation with those conditions at least, but uh, no, there was not. So usually the process of even getting into this job was that recruiters got young women from villages, recruiters traveled, just traveled across the country, collected those women and got them to tr join them in their return to the city by promising advantages such as uh, better education, um, classes on typical crafts considered feminine at that time that would make them desirable future brides, high wages and possible raises and so on. And most importantly, the parents of the women who, uh, as I said, as I said in the beginning, in, in this worldview, the young woman was basically the property of the parents. The parents got half of the projected future wages of the worker so there already was a debt relation and upon arrival in the city the factory owners deducted uh, the costs uh, for the trip for the wages for the recruiter for lodging uh, for teaching the women how to work the machines and so on from their wages so that that means that the workers became even more indebted to factory owners and had to provide extra labor to pay off this uh, this level of debt as well. Unlike the, unlike male workers at the time, the textile workers had no fixed wages and were paid uh, based on the quality or quantity of their production. Uh, and uh, the only way to get some extra money were bonuses for extra extraordinary quality of labor, which were almost impossible to achieve and uh, Cause quite ruinous for the health of the workers, given given their conditions. There also sometimes were uh, productivity competitions where uh, workers competed for uh, for mass or for for especially high quality produce. But the rewards in those competitions were not financial, but usually something like sweets or a nice jacket. So something completely. Inconse inconsequential to their financial situation. Yet those productivity competitions, of course, uh, and the bonuses for extraordinary work also, of course, led to divisions among the workers and uh, rivalry. Now, of course, since uh, the workers traveled away from home, they had to live somewhere. Now, this is a woodblock print from depicting the same uh, Tomioka silk factory we saw on the photo a few slides earlier. And you see those uh, dark buildings in the background with those uh, sort of yellow shuttered windows. Those are most probably the dormitories where the workers lived. So they, those were big group dorms where uh, around 30 to 40 women lived in one room, which of course was uh, very problematic with the disease situation we mentioned earlier. Um, and you, 
those uh, bars on those windows look like prison bars, and this was uh, fully intentional. The dorms were strictly guarded and built in a prison-like fashion, so with like barred windows and uh, door guards and everything, which in theory, or like the professed reason to doing this this way was to protect the virtue of the women, to keep them, to maintain their uh, innocence and protect them from the world, so to speak, because uh, in, this, uh, so in this Confucian worldview, the factory owners, when hiring the women, temporarily took the parental responsibility for them, basically. And uh, at least, like, this was an ideal that uh, it, of course, was not really applicable in in realization, mostly. But unmarried women were supposed to be uh, mostly kept at home with their parents. But of course, the actual purpose of this was uh, controlling the workers' communications because uh, for the uh, for those who could read and write, the letters were they wrote to their families, for example, were also controlled, for instance, and uh, most importantly, preventing the workers from escaping, since escaping from the factories when faced with those horrible conditions was uh, the the most uh, common and uh, to some degree also easiest form of resistance. And sometimes those escapes ended in capture by the police and uh, having to be brought back, which um, the, which uh, provides us with the police interviews with those escaped workers as a another source uh, that, uh, that has some descriptions of the lives of the factory women at that time. And also, of course, this uh, virtue protection uh, reasoning was uh, especially cynical given the sexual abuse uh, the women faced by the factory supervisors and so on. Okay, so now to the resistance against those conditions. So without any organizing for, or outside impulses, the, fir the, first the first strike in Japan was uh, textile workers being fed up with those conditions and deciding to do something against them. Uh, this happened on the 12th uh, June of uh, 1886, where 100 workers from the Amamiya Silk Factory in Kofu, this is a city in central Japan, uh, left the factory together. They uh, they gathered in a temple, which was, uh, first of all, a convenient excuse because uh, this was a good pretext to actually leave the factory since uh, the factory owners couldn't really prevent the women from following any religious duties uh, relig or like observing the religion and so on. And also because the temple just was the best public space uh, the women had that where they were able to gather in such an amount without uh, without raising much suspicion or harassment. So the, those workers gathered in the temple and elected representatives to speak with the factory owners. And after um, refusing to return to work for four days, the factory owner conceded to most of their demands. Uh, the demands were about uh, wages, work conditions and uh, working night shifts and the factory owner conceded on everything but the wages. And even this partial success already triggered a big wave of further strikes across Japan, of course, like radiating out from the Kofu region to other country, uh, to other cities where, uh, where workers uh, heard of this event. Uh, one and and of course, factory owners were at first uh, unprepared for this new form of resistance. Uh, one anecdote from this uh, that uh, shows this unpreparedness, and um, it's probably from from a union magazine later on, was uh, that in in the same Kofu city later in the year, uh, for women from a different factory also wanted to strike, but uh, it was. Uh, currently pilgrimage season, so there was not enough space to go uh, to a temple. So there was a very large group of uh, young unmarried women just wandering around the town, which was uh, quite unusual and somewhat uh, scandalous for those times. And uh, the, f 
and uh, they could just couldn't find a temple to sit down at some point a very embarrassed factory owners started following them and trying to persuade them to re to just come back and stop uh, being scandalous in public and embarrassing them and when the women finally uh, found the space to sit down the factory workers just uh, conceded to their demands instantly because they were so made so uncomfortable by so the workers suddenly being out of their control and just publicly wandering around and uh, embarrassing them, which which may sound a bit bizarre to us nowadays, but uh, was definitely a uh, thing of honor in in that context, because as I said, the factory owner had sort of a parental duty for the workers before they were married. Uh, this. Uh, so this success wave of the strikes culminated in a 300 women strike 1889 in Osaka, which uh, which lasted an entire six days. And also for the first time, uh, the female workers were supported by uh, their male co-workers who were operating the machinery and joined them in their strike as well. Of course, uh, while at first being unprepared, employers reacted with... Uh, stricter contracts, stricter work regulations, and um, um, trying to put uh, to place a ban against strikes in the work contract, which worked moderately well. And the state also mandated uh, more so-called moral courses for the workers in which they uh, tried to instill this uh, nationalist sense of duty that they should uh, spin the silk for the nation, for example, or, or well, weave, use, the, use their workforce to strengthen the nation. And uh, also on this cultural level, which is uh, somewhat interesting, there were several attempts to instill um, or to, to plant um, state mandated patriotic work songs among the workers but uh, this uh, culture war from above just never really functioned because uh, this just had no connection to the women whatsoever to their lives and to what neither to the, to what they were faced with in a factory not what they were used used to from home because um before the main, before the major innovation, while Japan was uh, united under one central shogunate, there were still different um, domains of land with different lords, and peasants identified uh, not with uh, some concept of a nation of Japan, but with their with the land, a piece of land in Japan they belonged to. So, there was no real national identity before that and artificially instilling one from above just didn't really work like apart from the samurai class who were uh, already receptive to the to those ideas and um and part and took part in creating this nativist philosophy themselves of course but those were uh not really related to the textile workers, apart from the very first ones that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so this is just a brief overview of uh, further organizing that happened because this one could just make a whole another talk about it. So yeah, this is going to be brief. Mm, after initial difficulties of not being taken seriously due to um, due to sexist assumptions about women and also their low education and uh, them being temporary workers um, slowly uh, around like around the 1910s uh, the female textile workers began to join the socialist movements and unions uh, slowly and began being accepted there in this image here you see a woman leading a strike against uh, the fuji textile mill around 1915 you see that she is uh, wielding a flag that uh, could well be of some socialist organization unfortunately the source of this image does not specify that but you see here a woman leading a strike and being followed by uh, several uh, mostly male workers in the background around the 
So there were several unions in Japan with uh, slightly different political positionings, uh, but like mostly on the left, but some were more, some were more centrist, some were more, some were more socialist and so on. And all of, all of those unions started to slowly accept textile workers into their ranks when they noticed that they were not, uh, not completely unorganizable and organized strikes themselves, which was, of course, uh, quite late considering the dates of the first strikes. Um, but there was one of those unions published a magazine, Seigi Hikari, which means the light of justice. And this magazine was dedicated to uh, female workers. It, uh, it published worker songs, reports from current and past labor struggles, and also fictional accounts of the workers' impression. oppression, because at that time, uh, this uh, so-called proletarian literature genre, which themati thematized the where the proletariat became fashionable in Japan. Um, so around 1920, so in 1920, the first May Day demonstration also took place in Tokyo. And the second time that happened in 1921, uh, for the first time, female workers also joined this. This was uh, brought on by the socialist women's group uh, called Seki Rankai, which means Red Wave Society, which was founded by several uh, socialist feminists who were uh, quite lonely with their positions, mostly uh, since uh, bourgeois feminists just had uh, took care of other concerns, as we already mentioned, and uh, the male socialist movements uh, considered this to be uh, a distraction from the main uh, main problem of class antagonism and uh, the demands of the women for better working conditions to uh, just be petit bourgeois demands. Uh, but uh, Seki Rankai per persisted and uh, participated in, in the first May Day. One of the members of the group was uh, working at, uh, at a fine tailoring school and made, uh, and made flags for this demonstration for which she was then suspended from her school and uh, which roused the wave of media solidarity and attention. And um, while this on one hand, state repression also began at that time against all workers' movements. Uh, yeah, this, this marked the rise of the, of the female worker movement, so to say. Um, so a, a question that, that occurred often both in the time this, all of this happened and in later research is whether the those uh, textile workers ha developed a class consciousness as workers or if their identity was uh, more related to the uh, to the rural conditions they lived in so it died and while and while certainly this f identity um sort of formed by the feudal conditions they came out of historically and uh, um, and, and lived, lived, lived at home, like many connected to their family and their home village or like home uh, piece of land was quite dominant. Like men, for example, many factory girls saw them as representatives of their family interests far away in the city from the family. And uh, this view of themselves was often quite empowering, uh, which can, can be seen from accounts because they felt like they were not now not merely the passive property of their parents, but also their parents now depended on them financially. Um, it still was definitely not the only aspect of the worker's identity. And while, as we already discussed, those, those appeals to building a patriotic identity for those workers from above by the state, um, by framing their work as service for the nation was not successful due to the concept of a unified Japanese nation be being uh, relatively new. The, uh, when, when faced with those working conditions and, and definitely when seeing the successes from their first strikes, a sort of ambivalent self-consciousness as so-called factory girls, joko in Japanese, emerged. Uh, the, the textile workers began to realize that they, mm, they now were involved with a new 
mode of production and uh, and became aware that their employer's profit depended on their labor and they could withhold that labor in, in case of a strike. Um, this, of course, led to self-worth and to quite literally consciousness of themselves as workers. This is reflected in many songs and in in later days reports from this union magazine we had, of course, and in some police reports as well. Um, and, and while quite many textile workers saw themselves as victims of the of for example false pretenses of the recruiters or um or the, the poverty that led them to accept the job in the first place a sense of agency emerged and uh, this ambivalence of victimization and agency as worker is something that is quite often reflected in workers songs and uh, there is a if someone is interested in this there is a quite fascinating research paper on that uh, called whose history is it anyway by patricia tsurimi and now just for in the end a concrete example of one particular factory worker who through a heroic deed became sort of a symbolic figure for the workers consciousness um, so Iwataru Kikusa was a textile worker in the Japanese uh, city of Nagano, who on the 15th August of 1907 was attacked by a serial killer who was hunted uh, for quite some time by the police. And uh, she managed to grab his testicles, so he let go of her and let his face covering slip, which led to him being able to be identified uh, and captured because she tipped off the police. And this event was quite big in the local and then uh, national media. And so this heroic action, of course, instilled confidence in her fellow workers. She was seen as this representative example. And uh, in a culture where um, this concept of respectability and having a good example was probably sl slightly more important in the West, this was uh, a major boost to workers' self-confidence. So Iwataru Kikusa became this uh, uh, from a, from like a person, sort of a heroic symbol for the fight against the patriarchal oppression, but also by proxy against the capitalist oppression by the factory employers. Like this is a workers song, also from uh, the late late 1907 that um, that Themisa, that uh, talks about this. Mm, so, so in the in the first verse here, you see this uh, re rejection of scorn uh, for this uh, for this uh, profession that was quite looked down upon due to this positive example, and uh, a call to to fight back both uh, uh, both against the male oppression that uh, those women experienced uh, due to and the, the sexual harassment but also this impulse to fight back is spread to the to the factory overseers and supervisors who while also perpetrators of sexual abuse uh, are seen in, are seen now as cap as the capitalist class to which the workers are opposed as you can see in the last verse of the song like who dares to say that factory girls are weak factory girls are the only ones who create wealth so yeah, this is uh, this one uh, one concrete symbolic example of this emerging class consciousness. So we're at the end of the talk now. I'll just give a brief summary to recap. So the female textile workers were essential to Japan's transition to industrialized uh, capitalist mode of production, since the textile sector was the biggest industry sector in Japan and uh, most workers in the sector were female and the sector absolutely depended on the labor power of the poor uh, village population and uh, faced with horrible labor conditions in the in the factories they traveled to the, those female textile workers uh, engaged in wildcat strikes which became in fact the first ones in japan so to those who don't know wildcat strikes just mean means that it's a strike without the um, like assistance or organization of a union. And this, despite their 
uh, ties to to their rural family environment and despite the fact that they only were employed for a few years those workers definitely did develop class consciousness of themselves as workers which is reflected in various sources and uh, while they did become recognized in and accepted in the wider labor movement um, later on the beginning was still quite quite rough due to sexism and also uh, class antag antagonism leading to uh, those women's struggles not being recognized which makes this uh, aspect of japanese labor history quite difficult to research so this is the literature i used and uh, yeah thank you all very much for uh, for listening now if you have any questions please go ahead thank you Micha. thank you um so far i can't I cannot yet see any questions either in the Zoom chat or in the compiled chat of Facebook and YouTube. Um, but maybe, maybe I can. Like first of all, I wanna I wanna um, um, apologize. I forgot to mute myself in our streaming program. So if there were like some, but in the first few minutes, like I disabled the sound input from me. Um, but maybe I can. Um, like find a way into the into like the discussion and questions um what i i mean a, a question that comes up pretty naturally i think is the question of okay why is this interesting for us today like the question that you always have when okay st studying something and studying something historically especially when it's somehow connected to political strategy and i would say that to like my like speculative answer to this in in some ways is okay we see certain aspects of the work environment in which these textile textile workers were back in back in that day um that do have some kind of similarities with some work environments we find today like of course not this okay you basically live on the job and you are like <laughs> the, uh, this entire complex is basically designed like a like a prison like not not like that but um um maybe like could you maybe comment on that like where you personally maybe would see um similar like similar aspects um of course like in different contexts but also today um i know this is like the standard question that people get asked like okay yeah um but maybe I, I will, i'll give you just a shot and yeah <laughs> um okay so this this is a bit of a hard question because of course part of what makes this interesting especially if you're coming from a historical research perspective is just that this is very under research and quite new because usually one would not associate this population with strikes you know like very young women in very bad conditions who uh, who also come from a culture that uh, is very heavily sexist yet somehow those still happened and it is quite interesting and definitely not like a done a completed question in research for uh, how exactly th this resistance came about and so i know this is quite a theoretical answer to your question as for similarities to um to current employment situations i think my first association would be uh, Empl employees in the so-called third world uh, in similarly bad conditions and not something not people in the west to be honest while of course one can draw parallels this uh, type of indentured servitude work because this due to this debt relation this is basically indentured servitude mm. still still happens in in the third world but also even in places like russia uh, to this day one could maybe of course bring in parallels of um connect like the increasing connection between the work and private life while of course not brutally enforced by a prison nowadays in the west also the, pr the prison metaphor was uh, very often in songs uh 
by the by the women like using the metaphor of caged birds and things like this mm. and maybe in like just as nowadays depression and quite often the sad consequence of depression su suicidality and suicide is is rampant um you probably have the mark fisher quote for this more in mind than i do right now um th this was also quite an issue with those factory workers i think i neglected to mention this when talking about the lodging but um when they, the women escaped they were not always escaping to return to their families sometimes the th sometimes both options were awful like rural village life or being sold into prostitution if they could not work in a factory just uh, meant that the only option those women saw was suicide which was also part of uh, part of the folklore and songs around this so yeah i hope this answers your question and you can actually provide the mark fisher quote for this <laughs> i sadly can't right now in, in this moment <laughs> <laughs> um, but we actually we, we got a comment um, by Martin um, or oh, something else. Let me check really quickly. Um, yeah, I'm gonna first read um, from Martin. Um, he said, um, "I think this type of exploitation can be seen in fruit picking jobs in Western Europe, where foreigners from the East are lured with similar promises." Um, I don't know the ins and outs of these types of jobs, so I can't like, um, but maybe and. Malte, um, Malte commented, um, given that, from my understanding, this was a somewhat temporary situation, most commonly until marriage or return to the family, is the developed class consciousness something that persisted past this period in a worker's life, or is it a temporary thing? Like, if you or we know anything about this. Yeah, that's an, inter uh, so that's yes. an interesting question, yeah. So, yes, we do, in fact, know something about this, this... You can find most of this in uh, in this paper by Patricia Tsurimi here from 1994 and in the book by Sharon Sievers, uh, which I am basing my answer on right now. Uh, so in either of those, I'm not quite sure in which, which is maybe the best example for this, there is a, a story from the memoirs of a slightly better to do factory worker brought up, uh, who mentions that after her, after her return, um, the like so for sorry for historical context while feudal relations were legally abolished by the meiji government they still um, that took a few years after the major re revolution and it still um was something that persisted a while illegally and informally where the lord of the land requested the father of this textile worker uh for to like send his daughters for entertainment for his guests. And uh, while the father feared for the consequences of refusing, the, the factory, former factory worker daughter was like secure in saying no because she, because she said that she could just find further factory employment and secure the family's future as a worker, for example. Um, while we, of course, don't have an exhaustive account or, I don't know, questionnaires sent out to the villages after they returned or anything, because this just didn't interest anyone at that time. Uh, I think it is quite safe to assume that uh, at least some of this class consciousness and uh, knowing that you are, in fact, uh, the one who produces the product did remain with, with very many workers. I hope this answers your question, Malta. Give me a second. Yes, it does. He said he says it does. Okay, yeah. Cool. Um so any further questions are very welcome, no matter if in from Facebook, YouTube, or in, in the chat. Um there is I, I'm to, I'm trying to come up, but this is probably like a very far-fetched connection um i recently listened to um a podcast about um with like the the, the newest episode of grace blakely's a world to win where it, it is about a book called monopsony capital like monopsony capitalism mm -hmm. it is 
obviously about like today's kind of capitalism, but they, um, I don't remember the name of, of the interview of the author of the book. And he talks a little bit about like the textile industry, especially like in um, very like labor abundant parts of the world. And okay, also like the, the it, it, it's obviously about like today's textile textile sector, but that was super interesting that, that um, okay, textile production especially in these like super super low wage parts of the world where the most of the textile production is done globally haven't really changed technologically like when you look he said like when you look 100 years back from now textile production is still roughly the same like it's very very low technologized and um that that brings with it like very low um costs of entry, a lot of comp competitive pressure in the market, and therefore brings also with it very specific, like very, very harsh competitive pressures on the workers themselves. Whereas, okay, when you have something like a, a car factory, which has very, very high entry entry levels, because you have to put like a lot of fixed capital into it, into in entering, like in building a factory like that, um, therefore, okay, the workers there have a different kind of bargaining power than the textile workers um also dependent upon like okay you need special education in order to maneuver that machinery or not and yeah that was just like an, an idea that just came up for like that yeah textile work and the dynamics at workplace that aren't just a thing of the past like of course things have changed but yeah textile work still exists <laughs> Um, okay, Martin uh, Martin Schmidt uh, um, Martin Schmidt asks: um, Do we know how the awareness of um, successful strikes initially pr spread? I.e., was the circumstantial word of mouth or deliberately promoted through letters, songs, etc.? Um, okay, so first of all, to what you said, like yes, uh, yes, the production, the, the textile workers' conditions are quite similar today as i as i already mentioned in the beginning when you said like how does this connect and i i think this is fascinating you maybe could drop a link to this podcast in the chat if you can find it right now um now to martin so uh, the first strikes definitely were in the kofu area and probably spread by word of mouth though um, print me print media started to come into existence by then and surely was also used I would assume that uh, print media and like news, just as they travel, usually were involved in spreading the word. Though I am, I got to say that this is not made quite clear in the literature, I'm afraid. Okay, I just found the link and I will drop it immediately, but there is another comment. Uh, okay, it's just a thanks for answering yeah. the question. <laughs> okay, um, I will I will just drop the, it's a very long link. I'm sorry, it's just like the, the uh, it's from Google Podcasts, the, the quickest I could find. Um, mm. Yeah, it's just like, so you, I think Google Podcast is like super accessible and... Yeah, that, that is really cool. Thanks. I did not know yeah. this podcast before and, and will listen to it. It's, it's a good one. Like, especially this episode is really interesting. Um, and yeah, maybe spe special account, like, um, they talk, also talk about, like, yeah, the form of, of, of the sweatshop, the workplace form of the sweatshop, and that it isn't, that it hasn't died down whatsoever actually although there has been like this huge scandalization i think in the 90s or something around the or the form of the sweatshop and the uh, abhorrent work conditions there and like there was a huge outcry and but yeah because of like the competitive um dynamics at work there and also at work of like between producers and buyers it's just, it's super interesting dynamic maybe because you have like on one side these like super archaic very we might already say like ancient work conditions and on the other side you have like okay globalized capitalism with these huge huge mega buyers of like nike adidas and like a few huge corporations who are the buyers of like these thousands and thousands of producers and you have like both completely integrated into one another it's not like all hyper technologized super shiny 
capitalism of the 21st century or like these uh, abhorrent archaic work conditions it's like no both mm -hmm. fit tightly into each other and they are dependent upon each other and yeah and this yeah. is actually this, this is actually also a great example that i did not quite think of in the beginning when you asked me how this is connected to current conditions because uh as you just said this it's this somewhat unusual or maybe like unintuitive combination of quite ar archaic and labor intensive uh production and in japan it was also on one hand the forefront of the of western technology entering the country is as the very first uh, instances of uh, of that uh, but also like very very uh, archaic method and really labor intensive methods of just like a huge amount of women having to still s do this whole silk spinning by hand on the machine and i think this is mm, this type of combination of highly modernized production with very um, pre-modern traditional uh, ways of working is exempt it persists across the world and is exemplified really well in those in this early japanese industrialization not only with the textile factories uh, though of course i uh, don't have the exact amount of details on other industries right now as, as far as I know, the uh, also gen yeah. mm? this is uh, okay, but like also ge just general societal tendencies in that time where, um, while there was a very, very strong turn to modernization, uh, even on the cultural level with we Western clothing, uh, lots of translations of Western media that were barred before and, uh, and all that combined with a very strong return to traditionalism with the emperor being great again and uh, hmm? and basically inventing uh, religious traditions and so on and i think this is this is a, an interesting train of thought that should be per pursued f further and i think now we have a comment from malta yeah uh, can, should i read it yeah. do you want to read I it I can read it, so I have a, hmm? some some kind of job to do at least. <laughs> um, yes, um, I don't know what I I R C means as a if I recall correctly. Ah, okay, okay, perfect. If I, um, in the pre nineteen hundred Russian industry, um, you had the phenomenon of seasonal industrial workers returning to their rural homes and um, being one of the vectors of spreading class consciousness from the industrial urban areas to ag in, uh, agricultural rural areas. Do we know if something similar happened to you? That's... Oh, th that's a really good question. Um, so from what I, the problem is that it, this is really hard to answer because in the literature I had available and, uh, like for the record, I, I studied Japanology, but my Japanese is not so good as to read the Japanese sources yet, which probably are much more informative. And also, uh, I could then read primary sources on this. Um, but in the sources I have available there, the connection between the very early first strikes and the later labor movement is not really well drawn out. So, I can't say. I think this is quite probable, though mm, similar similar to Russia, the rural areas remained uh, rural and like sem semi feudal in uh, both in modes of production and in like cultural terms for a very long time in Japan. So this was certainly, if it happened, was a very slow process. In fact, raising consciousness in the rural areas was a big problem that uh, Japanese Marxists and socialists and anarchists faced in the 1920s. Uh, so if, if I can uh, nerd out a bit about this uh, slightly unrelated piece of history or like- Please, uh... please do so, please do so. <laughs> okay, okay, so... <laughs> So there was this very big debate between Japanese Marxists that went on from the like 1920s and early 1930s about the nature of Japanese capitalism, whether Japan, the major revolution caused Japan to like fully cast away all feudal elements and arrive at a capitalist mode of production or whether Japan still had feudal elements. Now, this was an important question for Marxists because this uh, sort of level of development determined the next steps to take to uh, 
to bring society towards revolution and like what kind of revolution it would be. And um, so both of the, there were two factions in this discourse, the Kosaha, Kosa means lecture, this title is based on a um, series of texts over several tomes that they published detailing their positions, which was called lectures on the nature of Japanese capitalism, in which they maintained that Japan still had uh, semi-feudal relations, uh, especially in the rural areas, uh, due to the ways that um, land rent was calculated essentially in the same way as before the major revolution and uh, various other factors just had like still basically feudal con conditions for the rural population. Um, and while their arguments for their position were not always the cleanest, they mm, like, the gist of it is seems certainly mostly correct from current historical perspective. And their counterfaction was the Ronoha, the farmer and laborer faction, which was mostly defined not by their own analysis of the problem, but of their criticism of the Kozaha, and uh, maintaining that Japan did and was already arriving at capitalism and all the elements that the Kozaha called feudal were just uh, artifacts of capitalism distorted by the particular uh, lens of Japanese culture. And um, so these groups, of, of course, had very different approaches to spreading cl class consciousness in the rural agricultural areas. And um, so there is, unfortunately, it's published in Russian. Yeah, sorry. No, I wanted. To, so yeah, I wanted. I wanted to ask you if, like, shortly, yeah. you could go into like, okay, what were the specific, like, what were the differences in method in spreading class consciousness in these? In the, like, you, you are probably going to go into that. Or, uh, yeah, I was just about so, yeah. to get into it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so the there are there are these uh, reports uh, from the Japanese Communist Party and the Jason people to the Communist International, which we have preserved as letters and which I had the opportunity to read which are um, on one hand just an amazing source because it's uh, just as leftist debates are today, but with slightly more text, uh, but just the same amount of personal insults and accusations of not understanding Marx, uh, but also an interesting insight into how, how they operated. So, well, of course, um, the official line of the Comintern was that of the Kozaha. It, um, they, and so we have to read this with a grain of salt. They still note that um, par parts of the Ronaha, at least, were uh, trying to mobilize the farmers, but didn't really account for their level of education. So uh, then the Japanese Communist Party got letters from farmers asking who this Marxism is and where he lives so they could contact him. And so they tried the sort of like mass or mass mobilization that just didn't work out due to very different levels of education. And the Kozaha was more operating on the level of theory and uh, more acting in the urban area and trying, trying to work with trade unions, even though they were not always um, like complete, completely in line with their politics. This is like a very rough gist, and uh, I'm still in the process of doing more research into this in the term paper, but that's about like the rough picture of it. And of course, the formation of class consciousness was a big question there, and uh, it was debated whether it was possible for farmers in these rural conditions to develop class consciousness. And I, and I wonder if more reception of, of those factory girls and like their culture that they made would have influenced points of views in this debate to some degree. Oh, oops. So, da, 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 da. Um, I, I, I could go into like some connections that I'm kind of like suspecting or I, I could see maybe between like in, in the, the usefulness of inquiry into these different methods of trying to spread class consciousness between these um, competing schools or competing um, tendencies um, for like today's question. Um, but first first of all, I want to I wanna ask like if there are any other like call onto any other questions, comments whatsoever in the chat. Um, 
Otherwise, thanks already for the engagement. That's uh, super cool. And some really, really good question, I would I would say. Like, especially the last one was really, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Those are amazing questions. And uh, I'm really thankful for you for your great participation here. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I would say like this. Yeah. Um because like my, my, my connections that I would make up like that I would draw and I would like open a whole other box of, of questions that wouldn't really fit into this uh, talk, I think. So maybe some other time, some other place. Um, keep up with us on our social media platforms that I shared in the YouTube and the Facebook chat as well in the Zoom chat. Um, I could really recommend the podcast um, link there, the a World to Win with Grace Blakely, um, and especially that episode is really, really good. Um, yeah. Otherwise, is there any? I think we could call it a day. Um, is there anything, anything else you want to add or you want to conclude with, Micha? Um, not really. Again, thank you very much for listening, and I'm really happy that I. I could put uh, put this uh, knowledge to some use here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. It's super good. Cool. Thanks for sharing this with us. And a last note, um, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, no problem. Yeah, I think the recording will be available on YouTube, yes. And um, oh, shout out for, to, the next, to the next event. Um, give me one second. Where do I have it? Yes, on the 9th of September at also the same time, 7 p.m. Um, Berlin time, um, we're gonna have a German speaking event, which is gonna be uh, which is gonna be called um, uh, did, 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 Give me one second. Um, yes, am AKW gleich links Klimaschutz, Kapitalismuskritik und die Rückkehr der Kernenergie in linke Diskurse. Um, with Dr. Anna Veronika Wendland, we're going to discuss nuclear power with her and um, nuclear power and the left, basically, and environmental environmental movements. And yeah, it's on on the 9th September, um, which is um, which is going to be. Let me check which day that this which is going to be um, um, a Thursday, and yeah, um, so. If you're German speaking, we invite you very, very much. Um, same procedure as that. All the same platforms we, we stream to today will be uh, delivered to. And um, yeah, otherwise, thank you very, very much for listening. Thanks, Micha. Big thanks. And see you then on the 9th of September. Yeah. All right. Goodbye. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Eric, for yeah. moderating. And yeah. bye. <laughs>